Hello, everybody. My name is Miles, and I'm an educator here at the South Fork <laughs> Natural History Museum. And we're happy to welcome you to SOFO's new Zoom programming. Uh, enjoying the sit and staying connected to nature is essential, so we're happy to invite you to explore the natural world safely from at home. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Miles, an environmental educator here at SOFO. And with us on this Zoom program is Melanie, and she's going to help out in the chat. So if you guys have any questions throughout the program, we're just going to ask that you put them in the chat and we can get to them at the very end. We'll make sure we get to everyone. And before we get started, I'm just going to ask everyone to mute your microphone if you haven't already, because we just don't want any background interference while the program's going on. And again, we'll get to any questions you have at the end. All right, let's get started. This program is going to be about feeding time at the museum, which is basically, we're going to be going over some of the animals we have here at the South Fork Natural History Museum, which can all be locally found. And we're going to be talking a little bit about what their diet is, both in the wild and here at the museum. And the first animal I wanted to go over is the eastern box turtle. This guy's a native land-dwelling turtle. It's actually the only land-dwelling turtle here on Long Island. And they're relatively common, although their numbers are dwindling, like a lot of reptiles and amphibians out here. Um, part of the reason why these turtles numbers are going down is because they lay their eggs on land and they often travel quite a bit of distance to get to the spot where they want to lay their eggs. And during that traveling time, it's fairly common for them to get hit by cars, which I'm sure a lot of people have noticed. Um, but in the wild, their diet is omnivorous, which means they eat both meat and plants. And so that can include berries from plants such as blueberries or raspberries, which are both native. It could include insects and other invertebrates like slugs and snails sometimes. They also like eating mushrooms, leafy plants that they might find, sometimes even foraging on carrion, which is dead animals, and a lot of other things that we can't even list here. And so really quickly, I just wanted to go over why they're called box turtles. Um, as you can see on the picture on the left, that's a, tur a box turtle with its legs tucked inside its shell. And that's something that most turtles can do. They can tuck their legs just inside, which is kind of why they have a shell. It, it helps protect their, um, it helps protect their bodies from predators such as foxes, raccoons, or birds. But what makes the box turtle unique is that the bottom of their shell, right down here, the bottom of that shell has a hinge on it. So it can actually function quite a bit like a door. And so you can see on the picture on the right, that box turtle has not only tucked its legs inside its shell, but it's also closed the bottom of its shell shut like a door. And so that way they are completely sealed inside their shells when they need to be. And so here at the museum, we also give them a mixed diet like they would get in the wild. And so this turtle here is one that's eating the mixture that we usually give our box turtles. And that includes some chopped greens, such as Swiss chard, includes mushrooms, zucchini, which is actually a native type of fruit. And it'll also actually include some wet dog food because that kind of serves as the protein substitute instead of insects. This is the bold jumping spider. And actually both the box turtle and the jumping spiders are both starting to awake from their winter hibernation. And so now that it's warm out, these are both animals that you could find outside. This particular kind of jumping spider is one of the largest jump species of jumping spiders in the world actually, not just on Long Island. Although for a jumping spider, they're large, but compared to other kinds of spiders, they're rather small. Um, 
which you can actually see in this next slide here. That's a pretty big jumping spider, and you can see they're still fairly small. Let's see. So like most spiders, they do have venom and they can bite, but they will rarely bite people and are not dangerous. Their venom is strictly for killing their prey and they really don't want to have to waste it on something they're not going to eat like us if they don't have to. And what their prey is, since these guys are predators, these are spiders, they will eat insects and other arachnids, such as spiders like themselves up to one and a half times their size. So they're pretty ferocious, even though they're tiny. Let's see, In this picture, you can see part of what makes them such a great predator. Um, right up in front here, those big circles are two of their eight eyes. And those two particular eyes are excellent at seeing images and visuals. And so these spiders, their vision is almost as good as us. And so the way they use that vision is essentially to hunt and stalk their prey in much the same way a cat would. So they, if they spot a cricket or some other kind of small insect or spider that they might want to eat, they'll stalk it, sneak up on it from behind, and then pounce on it and inject their venom. They don't actually make a web to catch their prey like a lot of other spiders do. And here's the jumping spider we have downstairs in our museum. Again, a bold jumping spider. And they actually only eat a couple times a week. So this was a really unusual sighting that we got. We actually found and recorded the jumping spider stalking and attacking its prey, a cricket. You can see the way they're using those two big front eyes to see where the cricket's moving and then pouncing on it when it finds the perfect opportunity. Even though that cricket is actually larger than that spider. And so now what she's going to do now that the venom has paralyzed or killed the cricket, she's going to take it back to a safe place to eat because she doesn't want to get caught out in the open eating a cricket. because She's just kind of sitting there makes her a bit of a sitting duck for other predators since they are so small. There's a lot of other things that could eat jumping spiders. As she retreats back into that wood where actually her silken retreat is. They don't use their silk to make a web to catch their prey, but they do use it to make a little tent to sleep in. And so that's where she's going to go take that cricket. Moving on. Oh yeah, so this is a our first water animal of the presentation today, the American bullfrog. These frogs are a native amphibian, which are common in many ponds throughout Long Island. And an interesting thing about these guys is they're actually the biggest frog in North America. They can get if you stretched out their legs, easily a foot long. And part of that size is to help them be a very efficient predator. So they will eat just about anything that moves that they can fit in their mouth. Their hunting is triggered by visuals. So if they see something moving, that's what they'll pounce on, is if they think the size is small enough that they can eat. And so because of that, these guys are in an actually an invasive species in many other parts of the world. They're native here, but say in the West Coast, these American bullfrogs have spread over there, thanks to us, and their large size and lack of predators over there means they're devastating ponds in California. They will, they will eat just about anything, again, that they can fit in their mouth. So anything smaller than those invasive bullfrogs, they'll eat. But again, they have enough predators here so that we don't have to worry about them being invasive. And here you can get more of an idea of the size. This is one of the frogs that we have here in the museum. And you can actually tell this one is a female based on the eardrum, which is the part right there, that little circle. And on female bullfrogs, that eardrum is about the same size as the frog's eye. Whereas on males, it's quite a bit bigger. So our bullfrogs that we keep here in the museum, we raise from tadpoles, 
which we've gotten from our pond right behind the museum. And so this frog was only a couple of years old. They will actually get quite a bit bigger and live at least five years past that. And here we can see more of an idea of how big these frogs get. This was a very large bullfrog that we collected or that we rescued from a storm drain out in front of the museum and then released back into the pond. And the pictures don't really do him justice here, but this frog was at least a pound and a half in weight. And so in this video here of some of our frogs eating, you'll be able to see how the way they hunt is really more of an ambush than a stalk and chase kind of strategy. So that big one sitting up on the land there is really just sitting there, even though there's these crickets moving all around it. And that's because he's waiting for a cricket to get into the right spot, and then he'll pounce on it. He's not going to chase down the crickets. And their coloring is actually part of the reason, well, their coloring aids them in that strategy because that green and brown kind of splotched look helps them blend in very well with ponds. And that's both to avoid predators, but also to better hide from prey so that the prey won't even know they're there. Bullfrogs have an incredible jump. Um, really for a bullfrog, this jump here is just a small hop to get prey. They can jump five to six feet without a problem. Uh, the next animal here is the red swamp crayfish. And while these guys, these crayfish are found locally, they are invasive. This species is originally from Louisiana. It's actually the same kind that people eat down there. And they're found in certain ponds scattered all around Long Island. Thankfully, the, it's, they have a hard time spreading between ponds without our assistance, but it's our assistance that's what brought them here in the first place. And so they eat just about everything they can get. They'll eat aquatic plants, aquatic insects, spiders, snails, other invertebrates like that. But they'll also eat vertebrates like fish or salamanders, frogs, just about anything. They'll even scavenge for dead animals and detritus if they have to. And so they can hunt, they can scavenge, they'll eat plants, live things. They're very well-rounded in terms of their diet. And here you can see part of what makes that diet possible. These big claws they have are excellent for both manipulating small things they might find in the sediment to eat, but also to attack and kill live prey if they have to. They'll even use it to snip vegetation. They use their claws in much the same way we use their hands. We use our hands. And um, I included this picture of the blue crayfish to show you guys how um, a kind of unique thing about these crayfish is that their diet can drastically influence their color. So the one on the left was fed a different diet than the one on the right. And as a result, it didn't get that red pigment that the one on the right got. And so if you see a blue crayfish somewhere out in the wild, that could be why. So here at the museum, we have a small family of crayfish and we feed them a wide variety of things. Um, one of the main staples of their diet are shrimp pellets, which are basically just mixed up um, shrimp protein, some wheat protein and things like that, um, that typically gets fed to fish in tanks, but the crayfish love it. And so here you can see really how much fine control they have with those claws. So they can really manipulate that uh, shrimp pellet and tear it apart with their mouth. We also give these guys lettuce that we grow in our aquaponics bay. They'll eat lettuce, they'll also eat leftover aquatic vegetation we get from our pond tank. And you can get a good idea of how sharp their claws are too, the way it just punctured right through that lettuce there. I think we have a slightly better view of one here. 
Here you can get a pretty good view of their mouth parts, which is what they use to eat. And it might just look like there's a lot going on there with the different things moving around. And the reason for that is because crayfish, actually like all arthropods, technically don't have teeth like we do. Instead, they have modified legs that serve as teeth. And so these crayfish have multiple different kinds of mouth parts, which all help in different parts of the digestive process. And so what it's mainly doing here is using its mandibles, which we can't really see, to clip off pieces of lettuce and then swallow it. And mandibles are strong and serrated and kind of sharp. So they're good for crunching and tearing up things. But it's also using those two very small limbs to help manipulate the lettuce right around its mandibles. You also get a good view of their antenna here. And those antenna are sensory organs, so they can help feel and smell things in the water. So even if the water is really murky, they can still find their way around and even find food to eat, even if they can't see. All right, so we're getting on to our marine animals. And so if you've been to the museum recently, you might recognize this common sea star from the touch tank. And so they're an animal that is fairly common around Long Island, but they're usually found deeper in the water. So we don't see them typically if you're just going to the beach. When you will find them is if you're scuba diving or on the rare occasion when one gets washed up into shore. Um, one sad thing with this particular species of sea star is that really all up and down the northeast coast, the sea stars have been hit with a disease called sea star wasting disease. And so you, some of you might remember, um, and over 20 years ago, there might there used to be a lot more of these sea stars than there are now. And that's mainly because of that disease that nearly wiped them out. Um, but their populations are covered slightly, and so they are still found in the waters around Long Island. So this type of sea star is a predator, which a lot of people don't expect. Um, they hunt bivalves, which is the science word for clams, oysters, mussels, and things like that, those kinds of animals. And they'll also hunt snails, and they'll feed on dead animals or weakened animals when given the opportunity. But their primary prey are those bivalves and snails. And so the way these guys get to those bivalves and snails, the way they get open those clams, which can hold themselves closed so strongly, is with these structures all on the bottom. These are called their tube feet. They kind of look like little tentacles. Each one of those has a suction cup at the end. And so they can stick to the outside of the clam and pull and pull on it until basically until the clam gets too tired to hold itself closed anymore and is forced open. And then sea stars don't have any teeth or anything like that. So the way they actually eat that clam is they reach their stomach out of their mouth, which is right here in the middle of their arms. And they reach that stomach into the shell of the clam and digest it just by wrapping their stomach around the meat of the clam and they're able to digest it inside out like that. Another really rare thing that we got to see here at the museum was this sea star eating a slipper snail right off the glass of the tank. And so this round thing in the middle is the slipper snail that's stuck to the glass. And that sea star is sticking to the outside of the snail and pulling. And it pulls sometimes for an hour or more if it has to. They have very good endurance. And they'll just keep pulling until the snail gets too tired to hold itself to the glass anymore. Because that snail has to put in effort to secure itself to the glass. And eventually, once the snail is forced to let go, it gets pulled closer to the sea star. And you'll get to see in a minute here, its stomach reaching out to digest the snail. And you want to look here kind of in the corner. It's going to just look like a little bit of cloudiness. It's hard to see even in real life because it's very thin. But that cloudiness that slowly starts to creep in and cover that whole slipper snail is the sea star's stomach. 
So the whole process of sea star feeding can take quite a long time since they have to first weaken it enough to get it off the glass or to get the clam open. And then even once they get it open, they have to digest the entire thing in order to eat it since they can't just rip it off and store it in their stomach. They have to just digest it in real time. So you can see that cloudiness has really covered that whole snail. So that's that sea star's stomach just covering the snail and starting to digest. A lot of people don't really expect sea stars to be as ferocious as they are, but they're one of the top predators in their little ecosystem. The last animal I wanted to go over is another animal that a lot of people don't think of as predators, and that's the knobbed whelk. And so this is a type of snail that lives in the shallower waters around Long Island, and they're fairly common. A lot of people are probably familiar with its shell. Um, they're a close relative of the channeled whelk, which is another marine predator, but I wanted to focus on the knobbed whelk. The way you can tell the difference is the knobbed whelk has these bumps all along the edge of its shell, and the channel whelk has a groove instead. And so like I mentioned, these guys are a predator, these snails. And they actually like to eat similar things that the sea star likes to eat. So they will hunt for things like clams and oysters, occasionally snails, and they're opportunistic. So they'll scavenge when they find something to eat like that as well. But so a slightly different thing about these snails compared to the sea stars is they're excellent at digging. So a clam that buries itself underground might be safe from a sea star, but a knobbed whelk will smell that clam, chase it underground, and catch it and eat it that way. So they're a little more diverse in the things that they can hunt compared to the sea star. They're also very unique in the way they open up those clams and oysters. And so they don't have the endurance of the sea star, so they can't just pull on it until the clam gives up. Instead, what they actually do, they have a very strong muscular foot, which is what they use to walk around on the sand, They'll crawl around on the sand. And so they actually use that foot to just pry open that clam as much as they possibly can, usually just a sliver. But that's enough to get the edge of their shell right here into the gap of that clam. And they then use their own shell as leverage to pull open or sometimes even break the clam's shell. We've seen that happen in the museum, at least I've seen it happen once where they're actually able to crack open a clam shell, which is pretty incredible feat of strength. But usually we give them shrimp or already dead mussels and clams, so it's a little easier for them to get to. We do like to give them the live animals, like the live mussels on occasion as a treat. It probably helps keep that foot muscle strong too. And so here you can kind of see the, the whelk trying to manipulate that piece of shrimp into a place where it can eat it. And in a minute here, it's going to lift up. And so here, if we look really quick, it's a bit hard to see as they hide it very well. But right or in here, those two points coming off the snail are its eyes. And so they have fairly good vision, but they have really have an excellent sense of smell. and. That's primarily done with this part here, which is the siphon, but it's most similar to a nose since they use it to breathe as well. And what we can just barely see the beginnings of here, in between their eyes is their mouth, and they have a retractable proboscis, it's called. So basically a mouth on the end of a long trunk. And they um, reach out that proboscis when they have something that they're trying to eat and then the mouth is at the very end. And so you'll see it kind of reaching with that proboscis, looking for that shrimp, but didn't get it here. But just a little while later, it was able to get the shrimp. And you can see here, what we're looking at is the foot of the snail up against the glass. It's two eye stalks. Its shell is way in the background here. And 
this part here is its proboscis with the mouth at the very end. And so you can, we, if what you, one thing to look for, especially in this particular video I'm about to show you, is a structure called the radula. And that's really how they do all the eating. Inside their mouth is basically a conveyor belt filled with teeth, which sometimes even incorporate metals like iron to enhance their strength. And so they'll just run those teeth almost like a little chainsaw and grind up all the food and swallow it that way. And so while you're watching this video, you might get a glimpse of that. See, having that proboscis is very helpful for this type of snail because they can really manipulate it quite well. So you'll see it reaching all around in this little pocket it's created, trying to get every last piece of shrimp. In a little bit, you can kind of see some things moving inside the tip of the mouth. That is the radula. It's kind of whirring that radula, grinding, looking for food to swallow. All right. All right, so those are all the animals I wanted to go over. We have the eastern box turtle, bold jumping spider, American bullfrog, crayfish, sea star, and whelk. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, everyone. This is Melanie. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, Miles. If everyone would like to listen, I'll read them and we can share the questions together. Our first question was, are sea stars a subtitle or an intertidal species? Um, I believe they are technically an intertidal species, but I think they go into the subtital range too. Um, they just don't come all the way up to the tidal area where people normally swim. So they're just a little beyond that. Maybe uh, 20, 50. Yeah. We could probably clarify that by saying they don't come out of the water. Yeah, yeah, they, they never come out of the water. But they will follow the tide up the beach. Mm -hmm. All right, our next question is, what is the conservation status of the box turtle? Is it endangered, threatened, or a species of special concern? Oh, that is an excellent question. I think in New York State, it's either a species of special concern or threatened. Um, there's some thought that on Long Island in particular, it might be more so threatened than the rest of the state. Um, I don't know too much about that, but yeah, I think the official status is threatened or a species of special concern, one of those two. And dwindling, it's their numbers, their population is definitely decreasing. Right, I'm sure everyone has seen the signs along the streets and roads around Bridgehampton, beware of the box turtle crossing the road. All right, uh, there is just one last question, and this is for Miles. What animal is your favorite animal? <laughs> uh, I like them all for different reasons. I don't know if I'd be able to pick a favorite. <laughs> all right, is there any more questions? If not, I'm going to turn it back to Miles to give our thank you for everyone who is watching. Yeah, if there's no more questions, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Our next program is entitled Happy Mother's Day with SOFO Animals. And that's gonna be on Sunday the 10th, which is next Sunday at 1 p.m., just like this meeting. That's gonna be with another SOFO environmental educator, Rachel. Um, you can find the complete schedule of our upcoming Zoom programs on our website. And if you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, uh, you can find a whole bunch of news about SOFO and the natural world. All right, stay safe, everybody.